you realise that you have to make some sacrifices and, co- and compromises and you just have to learn how to prioritise mm. things and I think that's been the most in, most important thing. Episode 76. Hello and welcome. My name is Ryan Willard and this is the Business of Architecture UK. And this week I'm Dan in South London and I'm speaking with Rhys Cannon who is the co-founder and director of Gruff Architects. And we're actually on site at the nearly completed Pitch Black, which is actually Reese's own home. So we discussed this project with Reese in depth about how the building came to be, how the site was acquired, and what the process was like on being both on the architect side and on the client side, and what it was like building your own house and like Reese is telling me recently the house is all completed now and um, actually managed to have their first family Christmas inside the home so this is really interesting story as Reese tells us also about the evolution of Gruff Architects how they've won some of their early projects how they've won their work how they're beginning to grow and expand into new sectors um, as well as how they collaborate with other practices such as Matthew Springer Architects on more artistic collaborations and also some of the innovations that they've been implementing with fabrication where they're able to offer actual construction services for some of the bespoke items to some of their high-end residential clients. So sit back and relax and enjoy Reese Cannon of Gruff. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Rhys, welcome to the show. Um, absolute pleasure to be here in the Pitched House, which is your own home. Yep. a project that you've been working on for a number of years. Um, you're the director of Gruff Architects, yeah, that's which was founded yeah. in 2010. Yep. Um, you specialise, you've done a lot of residential work, um, doing all sorts of really interesting things with manufacturing and design. Uh, so yeah, absolute pleasure to be talking with you. And tell us a little bit about how you got started, how Gruff came into being. Uh, well, I started sort of maybe the kind of classic way as a sole practitioner. Yeah. And um, I was teaching uh, part time at the same same time, um, assessing up the practice. Um, it was very much it was on the back. It was 2010, obviously, sort of the back of the recession, and um, things are kind of hard. Um, but um, and I thought, well, if it's going to be hard, then I may as well actually start for myself and mm. go through those kind of uh, uh, growing pains and uh, build up a sort of client base from you know from there so it was you know proper kitchen table kind of stuff in the first sort of year and then um I sort of made the effort to take on a um a kind of local uh office space um from past experiences of practices i'd worked at is that i'd seen that shop fronts were quite a good a good way of getting a bit of exposure mm. so actually in uh in broccoli where where we where we're based um, I took a little unit right next to sort of the most popular restaurant in, in Broccoli. So it was very much is that we were getting people walking off the street and asking, uh, well, asking who, what architects were often, but um, were bringing projects and stuff to us as well. Um, I would say that 
the ones that came directly off the street weren't necessarily the best work, but um, the ones, but it was the, it was about the exposure, it was about our visibility, and um, being there was was very useful. And I think um, Broccoli's kind of gone on this upward trend of yeah. sort of being known as um, maybe less sort of since she's sort of flattened out now, but of being you know the, the cheaper place to come and sort of a really nice area. And so a lot of our initial kind of clients were um, sort of uh, private domestic work, looking to do extensions and works to their house. And and they, I think they just, they saw us. They were, there wasn't much of a presence of architects sort of visibly um, in Broccoli at the time. And so, yeah, it kind of worked worked quite well. Was it always your intention then? Because you, you're sort of, would you say that your niche market is kind of domestic residential work? Um, it it has, I mean, well, it's not intentionally. Right. Um, um, it very much started that way. And, and, you know, different people I've spoken to who started practice at similar times, um, some maybe a little bit snobbish about the idea of doing kind of um, uh, that sort of domestic work. Mm. But we, we can't, you know, we can't knock it. And it's, it is our bread and butter. And so, yes, we do a, a chunk of that. And... I don't necessarily see it as being... We, we try and take the positives out of it in that it's, sometimes it can be hard work and um, the margins aren't necessarily as great and things like that, but it does allow us to experiment. And mm. so over the years, we've had um, a fairly young team of um, uh, people working for us and we've always been keen to tell them, you know, use this as an opportunity, you know, go go learn on these projects and, they're, you know, they're... they're um, not too too high a value and the quick turnaround and you yeah. actually you'll see the sort of you know the fruits of your labor very quickly and you know go and push yourselves and try and uh use materials on domestic projects which you which may only be ones that normally occur on commercial ones mm. and it was all very much an idea of kind of gearing ourselves up for being being bigger and being able to grow and how did you start practice. moving into bigger sectors or bigger bigger different types of projects more commercial work um well to some to some extent it's that kind of it is that natural evolution i think mm. the um you know you always get taught is that don't assume um e every project is going to be bigger than the last and you know it would be lovely if that was always the case but um so we try not to make and that hasn't been the case and we try not to make that assumption but um we have used you know tried to use this type of work as a springboard for for bigger bigger things and in some cases, it's just kind of waiting to get lucky. And the, mm. the, um, um, the, the within the area, there was um, a kind of a client who was really keen to actually engage a local architect and was kind of willing to sort of overlook the fact that we hadn't done a new build house, and um, but um, was keen to, to you know like the design and liked us mm. and um, and. So it's, it's through those kind of incremental kind of steps, I'd say, that we've managed to, to up sort of up the value of the projects, but also just doing the hard graft in terms of moving into other other um, sectors and other areas, you know, the entering competitions and, and all that kind of stuff. And at the moment, we're trying to uh, move a little bit into potentially hotels. Yep. And so we've taken um, the steps to have a stand at the independent hotel show earlier this week. And we know that that's going to take some time to crack. I mean, it's not going to be something where we're expecting a client to rock up straight away. But it's we're trying to look at... We've chosen that particularly as a sector because we feel, see that some of the smaller commercial work that we've done locally with restaurants and bars and that sort of stuff, and um, and then some of the higher-end... Um, uh, higher spec finishes that we do for residential work we see as being relatively transferable to some of the more kind of aspects of hotel design mm. like the um more the lobby areas the communal areas those sorts of things which you know are potentially the fun bits and so and, and, and from the outset when you started uh, graph was it just you um, and how did you how did you grow the team? And also, because it's interesting, <coughs> this this sort of natural evolution from doing domestic work and then yeah. heart, uh, you know, and kind of moving into the hospitality sector yeah. is quite is quite natural. Um, was that planned, or was or was there like because something it's interesting? Sometimes some architects kind of how, how do you how have you found your identity as a practice? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it has been organic, and but not 
I wouldn't necessarily advocate that as being the right way to go. It, yeah. In some ways, I wish um, we... I wonder if we'd be more strategic at times, whether we would be able to move faster in, in directions that we wanted to go. Um, that's a you know that's a sort of a hard thing to do sometimes in parallel to to um to running a business and and doing your work but um yeah i think it's um it's something that we just constantly try and constantly mm. trying to move and think ahead and how to, how to push and how to change change what we do so we don't kind of get stuck on stuck on a record yeah and what were the some of the so over the last decade I and mean that's you know that's kind of you've cut your teeth if you like you've mm. you've kind of gone through a lot of the difficult you've weathered the kind of end of one recession um and you've kind of built a, 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 a you know a, a, well, well how many people we've got now about 10 um we're six, six a minute and um uh, we've been up at 10 but we kind of like i've tightened up more recently i must yeah. admit like brexit looming and things like that but yeah and, and what have been the biggest obstacles that you've surmounted and overcome um I think the various. I think um, cash flow is one of one of those things, um, um, and uh, staff retention, which is kind of a, you know a, an issue. And we've had fantastic staff over the years, mm. and um, um, been really lucky to sort of employ really great people through connections through teaching and things like that. Um, but um, they have a habit of um, qualifying and then having ambitions and moving on and and um, so sort of so sort of retaining that knowledge and building that knowledge, creating. I would, I would say the hardest thing is 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 probably creating um, systems and processes from from seemingly from scratch mm. and even knowing. I'm always asking the guys to sort of not reinvent the wheel and to go back and see what systems processes already exist and what kind of things that we can actually tap into. But that's still a kind of time consuming um, um, event, you know, and and because of the nature of the work that we've been doing, a lot, you know, as I say, you know, a chunk of um, domestic work and is that it's pretty relentless, you know, and you're, you're, it's tight margins and you're really going at it all the time. Yeah. So carving and creating time to sort of actually, um, to to grow and build the business is is difficult and sometimes you have to do that while sacrificing um you know delivery of something else mm. so th th those are sort of the kind of challenges i think we found and, and and it's interesting as well because in in this market of the residential uh, you know for an architect we yeah. end up competing against all sorts of other types of businesses that are doing similar sorts of services you know from you know all in you know turnkey solution yep. contractors yep. and from a client's perspective it's often very difficult for them to distinguish the difference and they might end up they might end up just going on price which is yep. always a kind of yep. difficult conversation how have you been able to communicate the the value of what it is that you do as an architect to your clients well we've we've really we have really come to sort of realize that you know our image and how our sort of um our style and what we portray to in you know um, in the outside world is really important and mm. um um, how we've kind of spent a lot of work recently in updating our website and getting that which looks um, absolutely <laughs> beautiful <laughs> super <laughs> slick Very and good. works really well <laughs> on the phone ah, good. <laughs> thank you um, and the you know the, the we see that people and our social media as well and so things like Instagram and, and stuff like that has although uh, I, I do appreciate that sometimes put to people to too much emphasis on that and I can sometimes be guilty of kind of um, worrying about making sure we've got a, a good post out there which doesn't necessarily bring in clients but it's it's amazing how many clients that we have had who have referred back to having seen our work through those those mediums and so it obviously does make an impression and when you are potentially being compared to sort of few a few other um, similar professionals who who are probably all kind of charging similar kind of amounts, then yeah, you've got to sort of stand out. You've got to be a bit different. So I think that it's it's in those sort of mediums is where we've actually been able to um, um, sort of really put out our, our our architecture, our style, our, des our design sense. And we try and more and more um, work with clients who, who are interested in that mm. rather than the fact that you're just geographically close to them or your price is less than the next person mm. and you know we um make a lot of time for those architects who uh, for those clients sorry who really um 
um, you know, uh, rate sort of our, our ability and what we can actually provide them. Yeah. And it's interesting, actually, you, you mentioned the you being geographically close to, yeah. to clients. And obviously that is a key. Often that is, uh, you know, yeah. the majority of clients end up looking for an architect through, you know, Google or yeah. they look on, yeah, and look on the Google Maps. Has a lot of your work been in the area and how, and how do you and how do you <coughs> look to go beyond that how do you yeah um yes a lot of our work has been local and um in some ways that's both been a good and bad thing yeah. and we've had many conversations about whether we should relocate so um i think you were asking earlier is that um, um i started the practice initially by myself mm. and then um slowly took on staff and then a few years in um uh, brought uh, partner um emily into the practice and she's North London based and so we've always kind of thought about something where uh, a bit easier to actually kind of locate yeah um, we've also in the early days I think um, noted the value of of the when I was mentioning the, the practice having the shop frontage and being in that kind of good location just thinking well you know is there sort of I kind of almost debated whether there's a franchise opportunity there to sort of set up similar similarly kind of um, well exposed um, architecture offices in maybe in other parts of London potentially wealthier as well yeah but um, no I mean ultimately um, we uh, we like being located here and it works from a sort of personal uh, reasons and and yes, we get a lot of local clients and a lot of um, referrals through word of mouth. And so, and that is kind of really, really important. Mm. I think when we, d we do try and work sort of um, further afield as well, but also we have to make sure that, that works for us too. And um, it can be connections in all, all sorts of different ways and um you know there's a bunch of work that we're doing up in lincolnshire and that's through kind of more through winning competitions um but there are other people who who have done the kind of classic route of seeing our our, our um our website and uh, following our work through social media and so at the moment i'm kind of commuting to shrewsbury um uh, every few weeks in order to see a client um mm. up there with a fantastic project that we're that we're doing and so as long as it as long as it's a good project, we'll take it anywhere. Yeah. And um, um, and yeah, you just have to make sure that that it's worthwhile and that you can kind of afford that the travel time and all those kind of you know. So, so and costs. that's interesting. How do you qualify what the kind of projects are that you want to take on now? So when somebody comes to you, what do you have a sort of any sorts of processes where you will like, actually know this is not going to work? Or how do you, how do you establish whether this is going to be a good client relationship? Um, it's, it's a hard thing in the, the it, um, it slightly depends on, I mean, you know, there's some, there's some few classic kind of things about kind of the value, the size and the, the, the type of work and whether you think that it, you can, um, ensure that that's profitable without kind of having to put forward a fee, which is unreasonable for the client. But, um, um, you know, we do, we do try to be discerning about the clients and you, We've done had a lot of clients, so you kind of do um, you do learn like the ones that are good to work with and are interesting and fun. It's amazing how t how you sometimes get that wrong as yep. well when it goes two different ways. You know, sometimes you think this client's gonna be a nightmare, and they're fantastic, absolutely brilliant, and and vice versa. But um, um, yeah, we we want to have varied and interesting projects. I mean, I make sure I do lots of different. Thing. So, uh, like, you know, I still do teach a bit in Jermaine House, doing sort of the normal office work, doing um, uh, art installation work, which I do in conjunction with um, Matthew Springett. Um, or all those are things that kind of get me out of bed in the morning. And it's really important that, that you know, you are stimulated on a day-to-day by you know day -to -day basis and mm. really keen to make sure that that's the same felt by the guys in the office too. And that they feel, you know, that they're getting a just sort of reward out of. You, you, you mentioned as well that you've, in this kind of line of, you know, doing things that are actually quite fulfilling and making, yeah. making sure that that's always present in, yeah. the, in the work. Um, how have you balanced doing competitions? Because obviously, for a small practice, competitions can be, you know, there's uh, on one train of thought is that it's very difficult to do competitions. Yeah. They're very labour intensive. It's going to yeah. be a massive resource, and generally, they have very little you know, it's unlikely that you're going to win just because yeah, of yeah, sheer yeah. 
huge amount of people competing in them and also we don't know if the product's going to get actually get built yeah. we don't know what the Absolutely. plan how have you kind of navigated that and what would be your sort of rules or advice for any any practice kind of looking at entering into competitions yeah. well we, we've um uh there's lots of like big open open competitions we steer clear of you know yeah. and and um so ones where we're invited obviously really and that there's essentially good odds and that you're you're against kind of small group of people definitely worth kind of putting in that effort i think um but the um we're really keen that if we do enter a competition which where maybe it is an open competition open international competition or something like that or you just suspect that there'll be a lot of you'll be up against a lot of people is that we need to ha ensure that we're learning something else right at the same time so it will try and if it will be a type a typology of building that we haven't done before. It's something that we like to move into and that therefore we are going to learn a lot on the way and it's going to be something where we can get images and things out of it that we can pr promote and it is absolutely essential. So we try to make sure there's always two reasons for doing a competition um, before we sort of commit to doing them because, yeah, they they take massive resources. Yeah, and they need to be... If you can build something in terms of your own design collateral and that, yep. can, that can be used either for internal yeah. research or, you know, marketing yeah, purposes. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 completely, yeah. So we're in this incredible house of yours, Thank you. which is one of these kind of dream projects for many architects. And it's like, you know, this is a new build house in central London pretty yeah. much, yeah. which is pretty unusual. Yeah. Um, how has this been a project for you? How has it been as a project for you both being on the client side and being the arch on the architect side, um, it, it's been challenging. It's been really. Um, and how did how did how did it come about? How did you get the site? How did it? Oh well, I mean, the, it, we were we were. I wasn't looking. I wasn't kind of. There was no um, burning amb um, ambition other than probably lots of architects have anyway, to to um, um, find a plot. So I wasn't actively looking as such. But um, uh, incredibly fortuitous in the um, a contractor that we were working for. Um, owned this site and it's his builder's yard and he asked me to do a feasibility on it to look into uh, building a house which would ultimately become his retirement fund and seeing the site I thought oh, yeah this is this works well you know this could be pretty nice plot actually and so it took a lot of wrangling and didn't happen overnight but after a bit of kind of um, back and forth eventually we were able to purchase the site off the builder and um, and then kind of embarked on quite a few years of trying to get the project properly off the ground, you know, and uh, through the hurdles of financing and and um, uh, and planning and all those kind of technical issues as well. And what what have been the biggest sort of obstacles that you've how you know because it's it's quite a unique well it's very different sort of visual appearance in a conservation area yeah we've got there and my first sort of thoughts would have been like, how, how did you get this <laughs> how did you get this through through planning well the planning was remarkably smooth and that is a lot to do with and it's funny going back to sort of the conversation about sort of the uh, the geography of of the sort of geographical location of the projects is that it's this is local to us this is our stomping ground and we um built up a really good reputation with with um, lots of the sort of the you know the key local people and so for instance a conservation area group the broccoli society we made sure we did our due diligence and we kind of engaged them and we engaged the planners with pre-apps and things like that early in the process and I think because of the other work that we've done locally um, they saw that we were serious and I think they took uh, took our proposals quite seriously and yeah. even though they're a bit more radical than what you know other things have gone on and so it, it was putting in the hard work really i'd say is is how, how we got it and we have lots of we get approached by developers and things who who are impressed with what we've achieved and want to know what's the formula and they're kind of key to how to replicate that on their sites and i think it is it's, it is that engagement it is that sort of effort to actually try and engage people locally um I mean, the, we, as part of the process, we did consult all the local neighbours, right. and um, we sort of, uh, which is not nothing unusual, I suppose. But I suppose what is unusual is that we we decided just to keep it to two or three doors in either direction, but you know, put letters. But that ended up being eighty odd letters because there's so many flats uh, locally. Right. All invited them to the local pub to come and see our model and to meet us, and 
you it, it's probably about three people turned up <laughs> so the, it kind of just it demonstrates that maybe people are doing their own thing yeah, yeah. Doing their own thing. <laughs> so like the 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 different scene kind of um uh people are in flats who kind of like acknowledge and appreciate that it's a sort of you know uh, it's, it's temporary kind of experience for them versus kind of being embedded in the middle of a bunch of um, um, house owners is mm. probably quite quite different but it's all been positive I mean we've, we've really not had any kind of um, negative feedback which is which has been great I mean, and how did you structure the design project inside Graph Architects so you how did you define your role as when you were being client when you were being architect, <laughs> and how did it relate back to your team and yeah. your staff, and how was that communication? And how did how did that work? Um, well, uh, we basically pay, we pay the office to do, do to do the design. So we were kind of keen that um, it wouldn't become a kind of burden on the office, yeah. where, where other projects and other work had to um, uh, suffer, if you like, for the benefit of of the house. We also kind of knew that doing a house like this would probably put in a little bit more time than 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 the most projects, so we we paid fees back to back to the office, um, uh, and so made it a fee-paying job. I would say that it still kind of often fell to the bottom of the pile. Yeah. You know, there are times where you have to prioritise other things, which is fine, not a problem. Um, so that kind of always dealt with that aspect of it. So there's never any kind of tension in terms of um, too much time being spent on this this project versus others, so that that kind of dealt with that really really uh, nicely. And ultimately, as a fee paying project, is that if it uh, it was kind of done at cost, if you like, but the fees are at cost. But any money that we did make, I, I benefit from that personally, so yeah. it's not a problem. <laughs> but um, but the um, in terms of being client and and architect simultaneously. Uh, sort of tricky at times, but kind of it seemed to. I don't. I wasn't very conscious of switching from one role right. to, to the other. Um, so yeah, I didn't kind of swap seats on the table or anything like that. And um, um, but fortunately, my um, my my wife um, has been able to be quite engaged in the process as well. So I think just sort of talking to her and just thinking about what we want as you know on a personal level. And um, and then using um, Emma in the office, who's an associate at the office, who's uh, mainly kind of um, brought the project home for us. Um, using her as a sounding board. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably much to her <laughs> her chagrin, but like you anyway, know, but but the she yeah she's kind of was been fantastic at actually helping us um, sort of manage up the any differences because we. We always find that you know with clients that we work with, um, private clients, is that the, the, the you can sometimes be managing incredible kind of tensions between couples and things. But um, I don't I don't think um, I don't think we've suffered any any of that. And um, and you, you just have to have a sort of awareness of things like you know the decisions you're making against mm. the budget and and the technicalities and all those sorts of things. But it's been relatively fluid. And and how have you used it within the office in terms of uh, a project to a develop and further your own personal yeah. design mission and also the business aspects of the of the company? Have you, have you you know I mean you know th these kind of projects can often be an opportunity to really showcase uh, your talents or yep. or experiment with new ideas and you know that that can that those in itself can be yeah. you know great bits of collateral which can yeah, help yeah, yeah. win more work well i mean in terms of how we um well we're at the beginning of the process i think in terms of like properly promoting it but yeah. having said that we've really pushed even now having this conversation in in a slightly unfinished finished building um you know we're keen to sort of you know, bear all and to show the the, the process. So, mm. um, you know, it was, it, 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 the house has had its own Instagram account, and we've kind of documented the journey as along with many other self builders uh, who exist out there. And so, you know, that's a big community to sort of uh, feed and tap into and 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 showcase the house, um, even to the point where we. Um, we uh, were here for open house as well, um, a bit premature maybe for the house not being quite finished, but it was you know incredibly incredible responses. We had I think eight hundred people come through the door, wow. and so 
you know, it's, it, yeah, it's I mean, been that's, fantastic. That's, that's amazing, though, 800 people just, yeah. yeah to see to, it unfinished. To, yeah, <laughs> to, really, yeah. To, and to come and to be able to interact with and... Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, we'd, we'd you know, really good conversations with people uh, in that, and we're going to make every effort to sort of, yeah, to showcase the house when it's done. But the, you know, we'd, the, the way we've tried to sort of connect the design and the development of the house as a project back, you know, to benefit the office has... We've we've tried to experiment. We've tried to use it as an opportunity to have a bit of fun and mm. to try things that we've not done before. I mean, the, there may not some some aspects of it may be building technologies which are completely common and out there, but we as a practice haven't haven't um, had exposure to them. That maybe that's you know in relation to some of the kind of basement um, construction um, uh, th those sorts of things and some of the kind of uh, building technologies in the house, but. But the um, um, but from a design point of view is that you know we've tried to say to the guys in the office who we've asked to engage in the in the design process at, at, at di different times um, to actually you know this is in theory this is a time when you've got a client who's not going to say no he's going to be open minded and so we should really make the most of that and we yeah. should actually do things here that we can never get away with on other jobs and and to really experiment and. and hopefully to demonstrate to those naysayers you know it does work you can't you can do it that way and to sort of make people to be a little bit more bold about the decisions that they, that they make and how has it influenced you in terms of how you understand your clients has it has it widened the influence or has it kind of uh made you more kind of like actually you know what we we really know that we can do something like this and um Hmm, that's kind of a hard one. I think like um, whether I kind of learned something as a client, I guess, in in or being the client mm. in this is that I think there's um, we always we've we've always kind of talked about this with some many, most of our clients, and potentially just the type of what we do. So there's kind of inevitable um, greed. I mean, that's kind of I'm sure I sort of, they can phrase it better, slightly better than that. Mm. But the um, that you know, area is important, and sort of that sort of space, rather than necessarily having the kind of amazing design moves and the, um, the big light and space and uh, that that you want to achieve. And I suppose I've fallen victim to that at times, and so um, uh, kind of justify that with it being oh, it's a tight plot, and you know we couldn't we really need to eke out all the square metres that we need to achieve. But um, but yeah, the you realise that you have to make some sacrifices and, co and compromises and you just have to learn how to prioritise mm. things and I think that's been the most Im most important thing and appreciating that those compromises, those opinions are completely different from one person to the next. So, you know, w what people value as being the most important thing to them. Yeah. So, so what's next? What's next for, for Graf? You said you were moving into uh, more hospitality type work how how else have you been how have you been going about making that that move into these sectors because this is this is always very you know there's so many different ways to try and <laughs> yeah. navigate your way yeah. through and well uh, the the um um looking at going to the hotel side of things is is one of the avenues i mean you know one of the other things is that we've tried to exploit to make the most of out of the house as well is our ability to to make and craft within yeah. the office so we um, we love kind of actually making little components, little things which we can do, um, which we can put into projects, which sort of lift them a little bit above, um, um, make them a bit special. And we've tried to experiment that with that in many different ways on the house and um, engaged guys to make uh, fantastic kind of uh, cast bits of concrete outside, all the sort of little things you love to do but you never get the opportunity to. And we're hoping that sort of through kind of showcasing that ability and those you know th that side of it within the house is that we can hopefully encourage you know other clients and stuff to actually be more adventurous yeah. and move into that side so uh, I, w I wouldn't say that we're kind of like looking to become full-blown kind of contractors or anything like that on, in the side but but actually having um on when we're working on the small scale projects and on up to the sort of medium size is actually being slightly more engaged in the the delivery of of, mm. of the scheme as, as well is it is it made you sort of consider doing more developments or going into doing like you know you've, you've now got this incredible experience of taking a project of your own from start to finish acquiring yeah. the site 
navigating navigating through it. It's for some architects, I know they do it, they love it, and yeah. they're like, you know what, I'm going to do this. As this is what we're going to yeah. do. We're going to develop this. Other architects are like, nah, don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, y yes, no. I think the um, uh, there's a there's a degree where I, I can't. Um, I need to. I need to finish this yeah. and it's kind of like it's difficult to move <laughs> past but but once having said that is that once uh, it is under my belt is I think I, yeah I have kind of got, I got the bug and I love, I'd love to do it again and I certainly have tried to w one of the things that I kind of had to sort of let go of early in the process was not to be so overly precious about the house to think that this is my forever house right? and that you know once you let go of that then you realise you don't have to do everything oh, it doesn't have to be perfect sorry um then I know that I've got another one down down the line that I'll do, and so I get all those opportunities again. Anything I missed out this time round, I can have another go another time. So I think, from a point of view of developing for myself personally, yes, definitely. From a point of view of being uh, from a developing as a as a sort of a business agenda for the kind of the office, I think it has kind of you know raised my knowledge and uh, mm. awareness of of how to go about it and what to do. Um, it has kind of also highlighted the sort of risks that are kind of um, these sorts of things entail. And, um, you know, lots of people have kind of remarked how um, we have taken a big risk and in, in to, to achieve what we have. And, you know, we had. We bought the land. There was no planning permission on the land when we bought it. Um, and um, it could have gone, you know, horribly wrong. Um but I think you. I, I think it's kind of. It never felt quite that way when we were doing it. It, it sort of we had a degree of confidence about what we we're doing, and you realise how, through working hard and being smart about what you're doing, you can really minimise those risks, or at least mm. the perceived ones. So I think I would be really keen to do it again, and and do see this as an opportunity to sort of uh, to to start in, on down that down that road. I'm, I'm interested to revisit actually what you were saying about you, you've. In some of these projects, you, you kind of investigated modes of construction where yep. you're able to build small-scale bespoke yep, items yeah. of it. How are you bringing... Is that something that you would like to widen as a service? or And how have you presented that to clients? Because you had an interesting story you were telling me earlier about the... For example, like the, the wine rack that you did, the very yeah. you know, the bespoke bits of dowels that had the, yeah, the scallops in them. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. So we um, when, when we kind of design projects we do look for those opportunities mm. and we, we, we we're mindful that they don't become limitations yeah and so that they don't become sort of restrictions about because we, we we're solely worried about how we make something how we or we can make something but um if the opportunity arises we do you know highlight that to the client and it's often that we can make those and do those things slightly more cheaply than if they were to be commissioned by others maybe some degree of sacrifice in achieving that but uh, with the, the with the, w the with the wine rack is that we came up with the concept and a uh, client loved it and was really interested they had a contractor who was delivering their f their fit out for their restaurant and was going to do this large bespoke wine rack um but the, but he identif quickly identified that there was components of that that he would struggle to make himself or to find commission someone to do and we were able to stick our hands up straight away and say well hang on a sec we can do that that's not a problem and, you know we always had that at the back of our mind already and um, just people know uh, what what kind of equipment do you have what sort of facilities do you have so uh, in conjunction with the office we have a little um separate kind of workshop dedicated workshop space so we've got a little cnc machine not you know not too b big a uh, size but we've had that for a number of years and we have to sort of you know we manufacture all sorts of components in there um model bases all those kinds of things um we have our own uh, 3d printer which is not so unusual these days but it's a it's a sort of resin based one so mm. it's kind of slightly higher fidelity and um and, and quality so we we and and basically and it's about having um i think with the resources also it's not just about equipment and space but it's also about people and personnel as well right so um we've been able to tap into um, um people who have experience in making and doing stuff and in s in some cases that's that's 
very talented students, graduates, mm. who have demonstrated those ability and have that knowledge and enthusiasm to do those things and asking them to come in and, and work for us and be engaged in, in, in making and doing those things. Mm. So that's where, where we've kind of like... But we, we do try to also ensure that we um, when the, we don't limit ourselves by what we can do. So we do try to make sure that there are local firms and makers, there's like a, lo a local foundry, for instance, that when the time's right is that we, you know, we, we realise our limitations and we engage people who can do it a lot better than us. It's, it's, it's an interesting, the beginnings of how the technology is moving with architects that there might be this um, scenario, well, it's kind of already starting to exist where we're able to manufacture or be directly yep. in control of building certain elements for a building. And so how that actually gets navigated into construction industry and how you're mitigating the risks that come with doing that yeah. is quite interesting to speculate for I think for small practices yeah yeah completely I mean like w the way we try and look at stuff now is that when um, you know the, the we, we, we're you know on the back of um, decades of, of being used to decades of mass-produced kind of um, equipment furniture uh, whatever stuff that stuff that goes in the stuff that fills architecture and houses uh, and buildings generally and realizing that actually it, the the ability to to adapt those or to make bespoke versions or to um is you know exists without it kind of necessarily costing the earth and um you know when when we see that that we're not when architects are not considering just about um assembling components into a building and sort of you know that all all we do as architects is assemble in different compositions mm. is when we realize we can actually adapt and change what those components are fundamentally in the first place that's really quite exciting and, yeah. and like that sort of excites us and we, we try to do it when we can amazing brilliant well when's when's the completion date <laughs> uh well it should be a few weeks from now we have a a, a family party kind of booked in so very much it, it, uh, we need uh, to uh, get the builders in <laughs> to finish it straight away <laughs> and uh, and clear out as, as best they can but yeah no it should be i would say within the next four weeks brilliant well thank you very much for your time and being on the show and thank you for inviting me to see your wonderful house no worries thank you so much and that's a wrap thank you so much for listening and don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information i look forward to speaking with you the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and i make no representation promise guarantee pledge warranty contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.